Hello everyone, welcome to episode 60 of Adventures Through the Mind. My name is James W. Gesso, your faithful host. If you've been paying attention to the podcast over the last couple episodes, they've been taking some pretty heavy, we'll say poignant uh, topics, such as uh, the last episode with Stephen Jenkinson was all about dying, and the episode before that with James Kent was all about psychosis. Although I don't intend to maintain constantly very heavy uh, topics in this regard, this episode does follow suit as its topic is heroin addiction. The format of this episode is a little bit different than the usual format, which is that instead of interviewing one person, I'm interviewing two people, Elizabeth Bast and Chore Boogie. Elizabeth is the author of Heart Medicine, which is the story of her relationship with Chore uh, as they journey through the emergence of heroin addiction and uh, into the, I say, redemption from such addiction uh, through the use of Iboga. Chor, uh, also obviously being a part of that book, is on his own a uh, well-recognized spray paint artist. A full rundown of what each of them offer in this world will come as the interview actually starts, but as a little preamble to that, the discussion here today on the podcast is focusing in specifically on how heroin addiction landed and the impact it had on each of their lives independently, where Chor uh, was the um, member of the relationship who uh, found himself into a heroin addiction, and Elizabeth was his partner at the time. So it discusses it independently, but it also explores what impact the emergence uh, or the presence of that addiction had on their relating and on their intimacy. From there, we go into a discussion about Iboga itself, um, the mythic origins of Iboga and Iboga's capacity to interrupt addiction patterns and, well, what it might offer one's sense of self and one's sense of place. And of course, we also explore being um, a medicine that can help interrupt, profoundly interrupt heroin addiction, what impact Iboga might have um, for the world right now, given the very um, profound situation around the opioid crisis, especially here in Canada, um, where I know that it is um, really negatively impacting specific communities, especially larger metropolitan areas like out in Vancouver and uh, in Toronto, but also all around the world. I am uh, very happy to share with you this episode. I feel like I learned a lot from it, and especially um, knowing people in my life who are in relationships um, and addiction is playing a very strong um, role in those relationships, a very negative role. And um, yeah, some of the insights um, and the balance of insights that is offered from Chor and Elizabeth in this is really beautiful. Their, their um, angles really complement each other and I think offer some very poignant insight as to the you know, the impact, what it might look like when it's in a person's life and in a person's relationship with their partner, and then also what it might take to heal. Before we get into the interview, though, I want to send a big thank you to Adrian, Chris, and Shine for your wonderful uh, PayPal donations to the show here. It makes a big difference to receive those types of, um, that type of support. <laughs> it makes a really huge difference uh, to, um, to offer that type of support. So thank you very much. Also a big shout out to my patrons on Patreon who have pledged dollar amounts to offer to me and to my work with this podcast and uh, my writing um, every month. I really, really appreciate it. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to see up in the corner, there are some names. Those are the names of people who are giving very generously to support the show and just sending an extra shout out to them for that beautiful support. To the rest of my listeners out there, if you are appreciating the content of the show and you would like to reciprocate that value with a monetary expression of gratitude, or as my friend Sky Dreamer likes to say, an expression of monitude, I invite you to do so by becoming my patron on Patreon. 
You can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash James W. Jesso, J-E-S-S-O, or you could do it by dropping me a one-time PayPal donation. The links to that are in the description to this show, so you can just jump there and jump over and give whatever is uh, whatever is available to you, and I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Thank you. One last quick thing before we get into the episode is I would like to thank Euphoric Lifestyle from the USA for the five-star review on iTunes. They say, Namaste, brother. Many thanks and much love to James for being so incredibly committed to this hard work. All information is delivered from deep within the heart and soul of each and every person James interviews, as well as James himself while simultaneously breaking it down in an easy to digest and understandable way. From that place, I connect with the information easier and on a deeper level, knowing it is sincere and honest. Thanks again, and may the adventure last forever. Thank you very much, Euphoric Lifestyle. I appreciate those compliments, and I'm glad you are enjoying the show. And I also appreciate um, the sincerity. I actually, I think this is maybe the fifth take of the intro, and I needed to just go outside and stop trying to be a podcast host and just show up and be like, hey, this is it. We're just, I'm just talking to you guys. Um, I get a little tripped up in my head sometimes, the difference between wanting to present myself in this really um, positive and engaging way, but then not pretending to be something that I'm not and having self-confidence and being what I am. And then it gets kind of spun out. So it's nice to hear that however it is that I'm showing up seems to be landing with the perception of sincerity on your end. So much appreciated. For the rest of you listeners, if you would like to leave a review on iTunes, I would be happy to read it on the intro of the show. So please consider doing that if you are inspired to. All right, I think that's enough from me here. Please enjoy this interview with Elizabeth Bass and Chore Boogie on Adventures Through the Mind. Elizabeth Bass serves as a yoga and dance teacher, mentor, healing artist, and musician. She studied at New College of San Francisco with an emphasis on art and social change. Bass is the author of Heart Medicine, A True Love Story, an intimate memoir about a healing experience with the sacred iboga medicine. She has experienced the Misoko Bwiti initiation and rite of passage in Gabon, Africa, and is currently an iboga facilitator training with the Bwiti tradition. Chor Boogie, a.k.a. Joaquin Lamar Haley, is an internationally acclaimed spray paint artist. His visionary murals and art exhibitions have graced many countries across the gro- globe. Uh, Society Perrier, 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 ooh, wow, my French not so strong, uh, honored him as a number three among their top 10 U.S. street artists of 2000. 14. He uses his voice and work as an artist to raise awareness about sacred plant medicines and drug policy reform. After the profound healing healing with the iboga medicine that is described in heart medicine, he also went on to experience the Misoko Bwiti initiation and rite of passage in Gabon, Africa, and is currently an iboga facilitator training in... <laughs> wow... Uh, slip up there. Currently in an Iboga facilitator training with the Bwiti tradition. Elizabeth and Chor, welcome to the show. Mm, thank thank you. you so much. I really love your show and it's it's a joy and an honor to be here. Thank you, James. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about heroin addiction today and I understand that there's a lot of problematic language and in the problematic language comes a lot of problematic assumptions around uh, what addiction looks like, what the addict is and, and all of these things. And so if I happen to, in the course of the discussion, maybe slip up on some language or even express something that might accidentally represent an idea or a paradigm that is horribly inaccurate, I, uh, I appreciate the correction. Um, so feel free to, um, to do that. Also, as a bit of a warning, I tend to ask really compound questions. Um, Let's get a little bit of a backstory. How did you two meet and at what point did heroin enter your lives? And specifically, I'm curious about the role addiction played in your relationship. Mm. Yeah, Uh, we met through mutual friends at the Rock the Bells concert. We were both there. We had just done something. This was over 10 years ago. Uh, and so we had just done a, a 
program for Playboy. And he, they featured his art and they uh, featured me with yoga and, and it was a rap party, um, like wrapping up the show, the season, and we were there. Um, Chor had done a painting uh, for Rage Against the Machine and I had seen his work the night before and he wasn't there and just really connected with his work and then didn't realize at first, but we connected that night and uh, it was, he just never went away after that. Hmm. So, um, yeah, that's how it happened. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. When, when I met Shore, he was sober and really like militantly sober. And so it, there was this overarching process over many years of just slipping back in and and uh, he had done opiates and all different kinds of substances in a really um, reckless way years ago, like years before that as a young man. And it wasn't until like six years into the relationship, alcohol came back in, which was a real slippery slope for him. I noticed like immediately getting into intense states of just dangerous states um, and then slowly recreational substances on work trips and then finally it was a return to the heroin injection some months before we went for uh, treatment with Iboga. Anything you want to add? Yeah, um, in my youth, uh, you know, I was a young teenager, very experimental, and uh, started, you know, partying a lot, and, you know, living a street life, and kind of came along with the territory of, you know, uh, the culture that I was involved in, you know, being involved with this spray paint culture, and um, from there... You know, started getting into troubles, going to jails and all types of stuff and, you know, experiencing death and all and all that stuff. And from there, uh, you know, got clean at the age of 22 and basically was clean for about 15 years. Well, let's say 13 years, 13 years. And, you know, and, you know, I met Elizabeth and everything and, and we've been together like six years at that point and from there I basically started I built up my entire career during that 13 years and um started making lots of money and traveling the world and everything and being getting involved in circles that I didn't even know like what the fuck am I doing here you know and so uh, alcohol, you know, came back into the equation. And from there, you know, I'll say about a good five years, it just started leading into other things. And like the last, the last two years of that, you know, it started, you know, trickling back into heroin. So, you know, started off like smoking and then then the last, I'll say the last couple months of that, you know, went into, you know, injecting heroin. So like, um, and that was scary to me. And, you know, basically I, you know, knew, knew I wasn't going to stay there, but if I did, I knew I was going to die too. So, um... And plus, I was going to lose everything, everything that I built. <laughs> and I told Elizabeth about it, mm -hmm. uh, scared the shit out of her. And then we, then Iboga came into play. Yeah. And when he told me to, to connect with the second part of your question, there was this moment where I just wanted to evict him from the house and cut him out of my life. Uh, and 
I never, I never thought I would tolerate that or be in a relationship with that kind of hard addiction present. And there was this moment where I just prayed, where I prayed and went out in nature the next day, shocked, kind of shell shocked and really dismal. And it was like Iboga dropped in through my crown. It was like it was remembering me. It came up in my consciousness and I couldn't remember where exactly I had heard of it at that time. You know, in retrospect, it was probably through Daniel Pinchbeck's book that I read like years and years before. Uh, but in that moment, I didn't know. It was like it was making its own way up through the depths of my consciousness to speak to me. And it said, Iboga is good for addiction. And, and for really for so many other things, that's not the initial, um, the original use of that. But I, I ran home and did all this research on it. And, and uh, from there, it was a process of surviving the relapse and actually getting things into play to get our bodies there to meet with uh, the facilitator that we worked with. Hmm. I want to, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about, um, a little bit more about that in a second, but I want to, I want to dial in a, a bit deeper into, I guess I'll start, I'll start with a question for you, Chor. What was it, um, what was it that you, that you see now as having called you back into the use of heroin? Huh. Um, usually in those situations, you just say, fuck it. <laughs> You know, you get a case of those and it was just like, it it was, it, it, yeah, it was just, I don't know. It was just, it just came over him. I, I ran into some old friends that I used to do it with a long time ago and it just, and it, then it just happened. Can I share something on that? Sure. So I remember this point when we were sitting after our whole experience with Iboga the first time, and he said, in regards to coming back to heroin, he said, I stopped praying. I remember, remember when you told me that? Yeah, but that, that, that's, you know, technically speaking, that, that was what, that had a part in it, that did have a part in it, but going deeper yeah it was definitely like falling back into old crowds and um just not caring anymore mm. so you know that's what basically led me back to to heroin and saying that this is not going to ruin my life or take me over again you know how i can do this just one time or i can do this you know a couple times and that's it and it wasn't going that route so i you know found a boga mm. afterwards mm -hmm. yeah and when um I mean, it would be it would be tough to say because because the the way that you describe the story, it, it seems like the the presence of, we'll say, um, problematic substance use grew gradually over time where uh, mm -hmm. Chor, your your injection of heroin again was almost like the like, whoa, there's no more avoiding the reality that this is way past the tipping point. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that long stretch in mind, what impact did this, um, did the presence of um, destructive substance use have on your relationship between the two of you? And maybe in particular, like you had said, you know, like you wanted him out, but, but you didn't, you didn't send him out. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so what did you feel like? What was, what was being jeopardized? I guess yeah. is the question. <clears throat> and how? Yeah. Um, great my question. life. Yeah. My life was being jeopardized and, you know, that was the most important thing. And it was either lose my life or live. So I had to like basically 
you make a choice. Mm-hmm. And it was it was more than just a relationship. It was my life. So, you know, whether she wanted me out or not, you know, it was either good. It didn't matter. It was either up to me to save my life. Yeah. And I, I felt a chasm between us. I saw <clears throat> like there's a place in the book where I talk about one speck of dust at a time where the man that I loved and recognized was being covered by dust one speck at a time over a long this long period of time until I could barely recognize him in the end in in his behavior and the way he spoke the way he looked it was like something else was taking up space inside of him Uh, and there had been a period of time before I knew he was taking drugs recreationally on work trips away from the house it was a time before I realized that that I just felt this space growing between us this distance Uh, now I know in retrospect, there was a lot of dishonesty at play. Uh, there was a lot of things we were both hiding from each other that, uh, was all woven into the symptoms that emerged as this addiction. Hmm. Yeah. That, that, the piece of, uh, both hiding things from each other, that was a very cool and very interesting reveal in your book. So I don't want to, I obviously don't want to go into it, but, um, what, uh, I, I, I mean, this is an assumption, correct me if, it, if it's off place, but I assume that as things got, um, as things got worse, as, as the dust gathered, there must have been some emergence of sort of dysfunctional relating dynamics or patterns that would come up between you guys that were maybe there before and became hyperbolized or maybe developed as a, as a part of this distancing, this, um, these, uh, this withholding of truth and the um, and the, the sense of not being able to trust each other. Uh, yeah. what, what kind of what kind of dynamics? Because afterwards, I want to I want to unpack what Iboga um, showed you about the source of these dynamics, and then and then uh, how things have changed since then. So, but I want to get a sense of like wh- what it was like in dynamics. What emerged? What dysfunctional patterns emerged between the two of you? Well, uh, that's a good question. I noticed I just, I wasn't sharing as much of personal, meaningful things with him. And, and actually there wasn't as much of even arguments before, I think in certain ways we definitely, there are, there were definitely some about different things. Um, but that that numbing you know it was like we had as soon as we got both got clean in our different ways um, I had my own issues I was working with even though it wasn't heroin Um, as soon as we got clean there were all these new communication skills that we had to learn and ways of relating and ways of being together that were you know we were so present it was a whole new leveling up that was really fast So there was this numb kind of blanket of distance and dishonesty before. And I also noticed that, you know, I'm a a mother. Chor met my son at about eight years old when we first connected. And he's a big part of his life. Uh, And for me, I noticed a big difference in his attention and his care for him after Iboga. And... And a lot of presence and care for our families that came into our relationship of how we related to our families in a more attentive way. Um, but yeah, there was so much more warmth afterwards, connectivity, whereas that was missing for in my perception before. Um, I think, well, I know when it comes to relationships that, you know, it's a lifetime of, you know, working things out together. So with or without a boga, you know, we still have our issues and we work through them. 
you know. So, um, but as far as like you know those telltale signs that you're talking about, like the the dishonesty, based more more or less on my part, living a double life, you know, more on my part. I yeah, think. and um, just not being honest and just keeping things away, keeping secrets, and yeah. that's that that's that was, you know, like keeping the distance between us, and it was almost like we were kind of faking it a little bit. Yeah, airbrushed life. And- yeah. I, and I noticed too that that layer of dishonesty that was there between us before, for me, I noticed it affected our intimacy. The and love, the love was still there. The oh, love, yeah. the love was always, always there. there. The love is still there. <laughs> it's just like you know, it's just it's life. There's there's just life things that 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 we have to work out. Yeah, and it it affected, I feel like, the... the Relationship or not, even with, you know, the relationship with yourself. For sure. And Mm -hmm. it affected the the depth and the power of our sensual connection. Absolutely, without a doubt. (laughs) Dishonesty is like a mold that comes into relationships, I feel, now, that I know. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, The way that you addressed that question definitely started to... uh kind of ask the, or answer the second question before I had fully, fully asked it. And so maybe I'll just ask if there's any extra bits um, that you want to share about, uh, I guess, in light of your, of your journey with Iboga. Uh, and, and I guess I'll, I'll ask this and it's a three part question compound. Okay. Uh, what's one question for each of you? And then a third question. And the question for each of you is, is what Iboga maybe showed you about why things were going the direction they were going in your relationship and um at least simply without giving away too much of the wisdom in your book but uh what it showed you about why things were going the way they were going in your relationship and in in light and for each of you and then in light of that what iboga showed you about what it means uh to have a healthy relationship Mm -hmm. oh yeah that's on the tip of my tongue Um, Iboga showed me, because there was a moment when so much surfaced, it was such a radical, fast cleansing that I wasn't sure we were going to make it, you know, I really wasn't sure that it was meant to be and that I was so devastated by so many things and, and in that, in that one of our journeys, Iboga showed me that he was ill, that he had been ill like really like physically sick, spiritually sick, um, and on many levels, but Iboga's like, Hey, his healing is complete. Iboga told me that like his healing is thorough and complete in this moment. And it showed me how, um, <clears throat> important forgiveness was and how it felt like, like real forgiveness gave me a palpable feeling of like my heart exploding into a million stars. It was so ego dissolving and it, and it was communicating to me like this guy is your blue moon. Like this guy is for you. This is your twin flame right here. Like you going to let him go? (laughs) You know, it's almost an Iboga allows for choice. It doesn't turn us into healthy robots. It allows us to make choices. It shows us what's possible through door number one or door number two. And so it showed me how precious he was. It showed me what was possible for us. And that, and that was, that was really beautiful to know without a shadow of a doubt that his healing was so comprehensive, uh, and, and how to be in forgiveness and, and how to move forward. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I boga basically just, um, made me, well, didn't make me. I had to make amends with myself. And then once I did that, once I made the amends with myself, you know, everything was set free. And then the shaman, Magunda, you know, brought us together 
you know, side by side to basically take on, you know, what what is actually happening with our relationship. And like he said, literally, he was going to divorce us before we go in because you got to focus on yourself. Mm-hmm. And he's going to remarry us when he when we when we come back out. And he did that exact same thing. And so I had to confront her soul. My soul had to confront her soul and apologize. And so once I apologized, then um, everything was beautiful after that. It was just like it was like a, just like a magic eraser. Well, you know, at that moment, <laughs> yeah, at that moment, at that moment, and then yeah. you know, we're still humans, and things still pop up, and we still uh, have feelings, and it's just the fact that if we, you know, let those feelings, you know, dictate the flow of our life, then you know, we we just got to learn how to or relearn how to control those feelings we deal with things a lot differently now yeah i mean we deal with things number one <laughs> you know and that's and it's just it's, naked it's honest it's and that's, different and that's a good thing about iboga is just that it helps you learn how to navigate through life yeah you know and and decisions in life and um basically within the tradition it's you know honesty and truth telling the truth and yeah. being truthful with yourself you know so that's to wrap everything up in a nutshell that is 110 percent it right there yeah and in in my vision i was able to see in a visual representation of what sacred union is and what that felt like and it's it's a complete ego dissolving experience that was very beautiful and terrifying at the same time uh, and i realized that you know real sacred marriage was going to require that and i'm i've been down for it so yeah thanks hmm. So let's let's dip in a little bit more on on Iboga specifically. Thank you, uh, thank you too for sharing so uh, openly about uh, the challenges of of being in relationship while also having mm-hmm. uh, heroin uh, heroin issues and uh, and the challenges of that and, and things that you've learned uh, since your encounters with Iboga and clearly a positive life transformational experience with Iboga. You've gone on to I mean not only you know, embrace Iboga more so, but even to embrace almost like a, like a public advocacy for Iboga's potentials for treating, um, I guess, addiction of all type. But in, in particular, I've, I, I've, uh, I've seen it around um, the issues with the opioid crisis. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, and, and even going so far as becoming facilitators. So maybe you could talk about what's happening right now that you see with the opioid and, and heroin situation uh, where you're living and uh, where you're you know doing doing your work and what role you see iboga um, playing in uh, in this in this process of maybe hopefully <laughs> uh, maybe not necessarily solving but but helping mm-hmm. helping this issue that we're all facing mm-hmm. yeah sure um, this is a global epidemic that is it has in, increased, like the opioid overdoses have increased well over 100% since the late 90s. This is skyrocketing. Um, and I hear about people dying all the time. You know, after coming out with the book, people write me up all the time about someone that they love or someone that they know dying. And uh, it really, it's, it's such a tragedy. We, this is such a gift of life. And there is no accident that these medicines are on the move and they have their own consciousness and their own will. And yes, we are dancing with them and interacting with them. But Mugenda, for example, the shaman that we worked with, the Buiti Ganga, as a young man, uh, he had a vision in Gabon growing up there 
very happy there. He had a vision of the Statue of Liberty. And Muginda was prompted by the medicine to go to New York City. And he didn't know what depression was as a concept until he went there. He'd never seen addiction on that level with those, you know, that, those kinds of intense, um, addictions. And he started to learn how to, uh, heal people suffering from addiction. Uh, and the medicine really guides him. He's, he's such a skilled, deep lineage provider that the medicine could teach him how to do that. And, and now, you know, he definitely works alongside and with, um, medical practitioners. There's a lot to be gained between the traditional knowledge and ways of knowing the indigenous ways of knowing and medical support and medical knowledge. So, so the aboga is moving itself, you know, and that's really clear from that vision to me that it, it's on the move. It, it wants to, help human beings and, and the ecosystem. I'm like this. Um, not everyone's going to make it. And, um, they're just not going to make it. You know, there is, uh, tools out here, put out here, placed out here on this earth that can help you. And if you don't want to listen, so be it. If you love pain, sorrow, suffering inside, internally, externally, I'm going to sit back and laugh, you know, because um, we're, 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 we're here to help. We're here right now in real time at this moment giving you some information that can help your life. And if you don't have no trust or if it's a trust issue or if it's some sort of sort of issue within that doesn't, you know, guide you to something that can help you, then so be it. So be it. Because, you know, sometimes I get tired of of, of speaking about it because it's just like, oh, well, they're either going to listen or they're not. Mm-hmm. One or the other, okay. you know. Okay, yes. I want to help people, but you know, I'm, I'm helping myself first. I'm helping mm-hmm. myself first so I can be 110% with myself. And that is a major part of this tradition. That's a major part of this, yes. this facilitating with this medicine, you know, because how can I be fucked up and helping people? I got to be 110% with myself so I can help people. So that being said, if I'm here giving you some information that can save your life, then I hope you listen. I trust you listen. If not, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the jungle talking. That is straight sure. from the bush. <laughs> yeah, that's the way. You know, it's like live or die, love your life or not. And it, and I will say, it's not. It's not a joke. This is not a joke. Your life is not a joke. You need to listen, look, listen, and follow the truth. It is not a joke. Life is a gift. Life is the most amazing gift ever. And Iboga takes choice. Iboga takes a strong intention, and we have to meet the medicine halfway. It's not a magic pill. It takes preparation and deep participation and integration, I think, Um, sometimes, you know, there is a mindset of people struggling with addiction that, um, it hijacks the, the biochemistry and the neurology to serve itself and it wants an easy way. And, and at first Iboga might seem like an easy way, but it really takes, uh, a strong choice. Westworld, Um, Westworld is, is bombarded with distractions, distractions, including pharmaceuticals and, they, those distractions tend to dictate the flow of your life. So when are you going to wake up? So that, 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 that is the truth. When are you going to love your life? 
When? I'm just when. That's just Everything a, good. the main question. Everything good comes out of that, loving one's yeah. life. And I, I, I will say, I want to add one more thing. you got to trust yourself in order to look. Yeah, to look, to be open, to consider. And um, I will say that aside from you know making that choice, there's a lot of people still who don't know about Iboga. I have conversations. The whole world. Just, yeah, I, that's just... why we're sharing so much. You know, as much as we speak out, I have so many conversations regularly where people have no idea. I go, what's that? They have no idea. And they have people that they know that are suffering from addiction or depression or PTSD, which is what brought me to the medicine was PTSD. Uh, and it was very helpful for that on another level more than anything. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people still don't know about it. The FBI and the CIA know about this medicine. They've oh, they known about it, it since the 40s or yeah. 30s or 40s. And, you know, they, they've done they run some tests and all types of stuff. And they just, you know, realize that this stuff works. <laughs> so if we want to inject this into our society, you know, as something that works then yeah, the, the flock is going to be awake. And if we we don't want them awake, <laughs> you mean the powers that want yeah me. yeah of course you know this is not a this is not a freaking conspiracy you know this is the truth and I want you to be awake so once you unplug you're woke so I don't know it's up to you it's up to the individual it's up to you you make your choice. Everybody choose wisely. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I'm 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 really uh, I'm really liking how both of you are basically talking about similar choice, but doing so in a very different disposition that complement each other quite nicely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and we, everybody says it. We yeah, balance each other. yeah. Uh, and um, definitely feeling this sense of like, yeah, it's your choice, and also at the same time the choice to. Uh, the choice to move towards loving your life is not easy because often loving your life means first acknowledging the suffering that you're in, like first starting to like being in truth. Truth is, um, truth is a strong teacher and it certainly isn't comfortable and, um, definitely living a life of unwoke or whatever, like mm -hmm. being asleep and just continuing to run away and hide from things and maybe be like, um, mm -hmm. an adult child and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not taking responsibility and just trying to hide from it and get what you can and just like stay in this. It, it comes from a place of being deeply wounded. And in order to heal, oftentimes we have to face that wounding. And it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult choice, but in the end it is, it is a choice, but it's it's certainly not an easier or a simple one uh, necessarily. And uh, I like what you said there about Iboga as well. It's like it doesn't make the choice. It's not the magic bullet. It's like from what what I understand about Iboga, I've never taken it or I've never um, I've never brought it on board. See, you know what? I love yeah. I love I love what uh, us humans created within a civilization within itself. You know, that's that's. There's no doubt about it. We are smart human beings, but it's just the fact that we have disregarded our history, disregarded the roots. So once once we acknowledge the the roots, then you know, and and and, and combine them with what we've created today, I think that I think we would be we would be in a good position in mm -hmm. life. And thank you for for saying that, and and thank you for yeah. saying that, James. About yeah, sometimes we need help to move past, you know, to acknowledge what's there and the tangled web that we might have found ourselves in when we're that polluted or or wounded. Mm -hmm. And and Iboga is such a helping spirit, a benevolent helping spirit. It was the words he said after his first journey the next morning that were so beautiful to me. He had been so dark and angry and frustrated um, and mean, just <laughs> going through so much. And then the next day he wakes up and he says, I love my life. And it felt like that 
hit a very core issue in, that was needed for his healing. And the iboga helped. The iboga can help clear all the pollution that's in the way of seeing that. Hmm. Yeah. This, this connection with roots um, is beautiful. I do want to make one comment too, is like sometimes we need a lot of help, but again, you know, like, like Troy, like you said, in the end, it's like, it's not up to all the people that care about me as to whether or not I choose to heal. Right. Yes. It'll make, it'll make it easier when the time comes mm -hmm. and it can make it more difficult if the opposite is true. If yeah. I'm in a toxic environment, but in the end, it's up to, it's up to me to say I want to do this, and yeah. I am committed to seeing through the challenges. Um, you know, if I want if I want to if I want to get to the top of the mountain, I got to climb it. Mm -hmm. And in yes. the end, I'm the one that's got to climb it, no matter how many people are there to hold my hand, <laughs> or make it happen, uh, or you know, yeah. encourage me along the way, or even even climb along with me. Right. So, so I want to get into a little bit about the roots, actually, because both of mm -hmm. you um, have invested a lot of time now in Africa. Engaging oh, yeah. the birthplace uh, of Iboga. I mean, I guess maybe, right. maybe the birthplace of, of all of mankind, depending on what uh, yes. <laughs> evolutionary uh, oh, paradigm is. you look at. But um, and you've now both become ambassadors of uh, of the original uh, the Misoko Bwiti tradition, and you have blessings from the indigenous people to do so. Maybe yes. uh, you well, could give we us say ambassadors, but you know, <laughs> well, yeah, we play we play we play our part. They they've definitely. Uh, asked us and expressed support and enthusiasm to share, to share our experience, to share what we know, like Jean-Claude and Mama Nunu and Muginda, they're like, go and share this in the West. Yeah. So in that sense, yes, um, it was very clear, you know, yeah. and Muginda always was supportive of the book. I wouldn't have written it without his, um, Consent. Yeah. his blessing and, and his request. He's like, yeah. yeah. You know, he didn't ask me to do it, but I, I consulted with him about it, and he immediately had a yes. Um, and so, yeah, that we're still learning, and I just want to say that we're not graduated facilitators yet. We're in a deep, long process and could be close. It's a whole different way of relating to curriculum and graduation. Muginda consults the spirits before we are graduated, so uh, we're dedicated and committed to serving the medicine however that looks, however is best however that generous spirit would like us to do so so we're, we're in a process and go, about to go back to Africa for another month mm -hmm. and could be going on an expedition deep to meet the Bobongo people uh, sometimes referred to as the pygmies and they were the first holders of Iboga and the second oldest genetic line in the world very old tradition and they were the ones who shared it with the Bwiti there's a few different branches of the Bwiti, but the Misoko is one of the oldest. Um, they've been working with it really since ancient times. We don't know how long because they don't relate to time in the same way. And they don't they don't uh, write anything down. Oh, it's completely it's oral almost, tradition. It's a oral tradition. You have yeah, to listen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. Uh, my next question was was about the, st the story of Iboga, uh, and you you gave me one, uh, mm -hmm. but perhaps if um, if you have uh, like if there's like a myth a mythological story around like Iboga or uh, or what have you like the Iboga spirit, why it came and how it came, I'd yeah. be really I'd be really interested in in hearing that. Yeah, yeah, I love this story. Yeah. There there was a Bobongo mm -hmm. man who was hunting and checking his traps deep in the jungle. Uh, and found a porcupine at the end of the day and brought it home to his wife uh, to cook. Uh, porcupine is something that they eat a lot, and he got drunk on palm wine is the story that we have. There are a few different stories depending on the lineage, but this is definitely the misoko that, that, that we know. Um, so he passed out on palm wine, and the wife said, oh, I'm going to eat this all by myself. I'm going to go for it. And she eats this porcupine and begins to have these visions. She sees all the people in her village. She sees her ancestors. She has a life review. She thinks she might be dying. You know, she starts to shake and feel warm. And the next day, she tells her husband, who doesn't really believe her. They, they go to talk to the chief of the village. And she says, I had this experience. And so the chief said, OK, let's retrace your steps. Um, take us back to the place where you found the porcupine. 
And so they go back and they saw that this plant had been gnawed on. And and so they're like, "Mm, it's clear the porcupine was eating this. And so the chief asks his wife, because he didn't want to do it is the story. So he asked his wife, there's two, two women in the origin story. So he asked his wife like, hey, can you try this out? Can we test this on you? <laughs> and she does. And she has the same experience. And at that point, the Iboga spirit introduced itself to her. And it said, I have come to answer your questions. Because people before that were asking, what is God? Where do we come from? What is life? You know, these really important existential questions and also questions about science of nature, all these different questions. And so Iboga said, I've come to answer your questions. And it said, I have been watching human beings for a long time. And, and I'm here to help you. So, which makes sense. Like if you've ever read Michael Pollan's book, um, the botany of desire, where plants It's not just us tinkering with nature is the theory that he's bringing forth. It's that nature is equally interacting and co-evolving with us. So it makes sense that that in one of the oldest jungles in the world that's intact, this plant was watching us literally and aware of human beings. And I think because the plant is so used for prophecy of what could be, not what's set in stone, but what could be. Uh, it knew was my feeling. It knew where human beings were going. It knew the kinds of problems we would encounter. It knew what problems would arise from addiction. Um, it, it, I, I feel like it could foresee all of that and developed itself to help us. So that's the origin story. And then, then the origin story goes deeper as far as like, um, you know, how it, how it, you know, it, introduced itself to the to the tribes so like the there was uh somebody from the masogo that was you know i I think he was a shaman or or not i don't think he was a shaman he might have been a shaman or he was he was uh he was a chief i think and then his wife was sick for wild and they were trying everything plant medicines and everything to to heal her and nothing was working so he was gonna go into the bush for as long as it takes until he finds till he finds something that's gonna heal his wife and so he was out there days weeks months and he ran upon this little man this little pygmy man and and they were just like, "Whoa, what, what? Who are you? What are you doing out here?" And all this, this, and that, and type of stuff. And so, from there, you know, he told him his situation, and then he's like, "Well, come back to my village, and you know, we can probably we can help you." And so, from that, you know, he went back in, to his village, and apparently they they gave him the the medicine, and you know. He took the medicine and then they told the medicine told him, you know, the things to get to heal his wife. Mm -hmm. And um, he went back, got the stuff and got the plants and healed his wife. Mm -hmm. From there, then everybody was like, wow, this is a miracle. Let's go see these people again. And so. You know, that was the introduction between the tribes and the pygmies and sharing the Iboga medicine. Mm -hmm. And then from there, the traditions were learned and taught and leading into existence. So everything came out of the bush. Everything, every living thing came out of the bush. So I guess uh, I guess regardless of what tradition we go into, every everything came out of the bush in some way. Everything came right? out yes. of the bush. That's... So every living thing. Yeah. <laughs> so from, from from okay, so from the cultural roots of the root bark uh, to the contemporary society, we've got um, like we spoke about, we have a serious opioid 
epidemic happening uh, around the world, but especially uh, hits very close to home for me here in Canada. And obviously it hits pretty close to home for you guys down there in the United States. You're in Cali- California, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Iboga isn't... Uh, Iboga is not immune to the threat of overharvesting and over extraction mm-hmm. and certainly isn't immune to the impact that a globalized uh, and I have no problem necessarily with capitalism in principle, but it's certainly not immune to the tendencies for a globalized capitalistic mm-hmm. market to extract natural resources um, despite um Despite its uh, its its finite nature and and only then profiting more so off 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 the rarity of something going away because of the extraction. So my question is, living now in uh, you know back and forth in Africa and, and being a part of this of this um, you know long standing cultural tradition, what are you seeing as the threats uh, of iboga, especially as it's going to get more and more um more and more known yes. what what do you see now like what is western um and what impact is it having not only on potentially the iboga plant but on the culture like do you see um what the context of, of western colonization and the global marketplace and the global trade of iboga is having uh on on the traditions and on the plant itself yeah i hmm. uh there's a few different responses to that um I just want to say my battery is running a bit low, so we might have to change positions in a moment. Um, There's different responses because the shaman that we work with will tell you that there is abundant iboga and he laughs when people says that there are sustainability issues. However, you know, and they have, they they are definitely connected to vast um, resources for iboga. However, other people who have spent time in Gabon and spent time uh, in different places with the Bwiti, will, like such as Jonathan Dickinson, uh, the former head of the Global Ibo Game Therapy Alliance. Yeah, he's will, been on the show, actually. Yeah, he's great. And yeah. he'll, he'll say that, yeah, that there are areas that are definitely impacted by the over-harvesting of Iboga. There's even um, elephant poachers that are involved in the taking of Iboga. And this is not a sustainable harvest like like our tribe does with ceremony, only taking uh, with permission from the plant, only taking as much as they need and allowing the plant to live. Like, so there's some very dark energies out there just grabbing iboga, not in a sustainable way, probably not even mature medicine. It takes seven to 10 years to become powerful enough to do a detox or a ceremonial dose. And it's on iboga world. We see it on the dark web. Um, And uh, Dr. Deborah Mash, one of the earliest ibogaine researchers, she tested personally a lot of the medicine that's available online. And it's it's sometimes weak or moldy, uh, often adulterated or mixed with other uh, substances and plants that, uh, one, it was found to be cardiotoxic and having similar symptoms, but it wasn't iboga or wasn't straight iboga. Um, so yeah, there is social impact. Some places I've heard they're starting to substitute the use of iboga for alcohol in some ceremonies. Mm. Um, yeah, it is an issue. It is an issue. So there's both answers. And even with the abundant reserves that some people have of iboga, there, there is an impact. We have to look for the future. We have 160 million people suffering from addiction right now. They can't all take iboga out of the jungle. There's um, an alternate option, I think, at least for initial detox called Bokanga Africana, that is much more sustainable to grow, much easier to grow as a source of ibogaine, at least for detox. And then I think a lot of people benefit from an initial medical detox with ibogaine and then a deeper journey into healing the soul with the Bwiti. Um, I've heard of great results from that. And some people can jump right into healing with the Bwitis. So it's something we need to pay attention to. We need to be, um, we would like to be involved in projects for supporting Iboga sustainability. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's in our awareness and needs more attention. Mm. Um, like I said, not everybody's going to make it. So, um, 
sustainability or not. What I was told that there's nothing to worry about. Um, but it, 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 I don't I don't see healing the entire world with this plant medicine. Yeah, it might no, not, that might not know, happen. Yeah, and there's other there's other plants out there that can help people, but you know, I don't see this one helping the entire world. Unless, you know, it's strategically thought out and planned. So um, on that note, it's just, yeah, you know, get it while it's hot, I guess. You know? <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, we want to give back. We, we want to give back to the tribe, back to the people, plant more iboga trees. Well, and, of course, you're going to have to do that when you pay for it. People, so, yeah. People going to <laughs> do retreats in Africa is actually really helpful because they want to be keeping their culture. They're, you know, they're given resources to have everything that they need and plant more trees. And so, you know, these retreats to go experience it in the motherland can be really helpful if they're if they're done with care. Right, and uh, and uh, careful not to turn, you know, various places in Gabon, in Africa, to what happened to Iquitos with the ayahuasca boom, which mm. uh, yeah. yeah, 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 people have to be careful and discerning. So, and I have a page so on my site basically with iboga resources. It has to be <laughs> it has to be controlled. Like I mean, really, it would have to be controlled by the tribes. It would yeah. definitely have to be controlled by the tribes. So there wouldn't be any like any craziness going on within the country, you know, to 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 try to just just to even try to steal this medicine. Yeah. You know, so it's like it definitely has to be controlled by the tribe. Yeah. So um, I'm going to need to take a super quick break to just plug in your computer. Yeah. Yeah, do yeah. that because yeah. the, the last question I have is, is Chor, it's for you. And um, yeah. I really don't want to not ask the question. So I yeah. can cut this. Li- I'll cut this little bit out. Thanks so much. One second. Yeah. So, you know, it's just telling the truth, brother. You know, that's it. You just, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, she comes from more of an analytical background. And me, like I said, I came from the street. So it's like, I learned a lot from this medicine. This medicine really, like, helped my life. Uh, welcome back. We are now through our little intermission. And uh, <clears throat> anyways, so, Chor, the, my final question is for you. Uh, and it is a compound question. So you're an African-American man. Mm. Iboga is a part of your cultural roots. Mm-hmm. So here are the questions. I wrote them down because I want them to be very clear. How did this uh, how did this influence your first encounters with Iboga? And what impact has connecting with Iboga had on your sense of self and cultural identity, mm. uh, especially with reconnecting to this part of your heritage? And, and this is the last part of the compound question. What impact do you see the disconnection uh, from cultural heritage having mm. on modern African-American communities in the United States? Oh, geez. I saw this question. I was like, this is probably the best question out of the whole thing. (laughs) Um, Let me just start it off like this. When we went to go do Iboga in Costa Rica with Bogunda, shaman, right? Um, He was, the teachings that he was teaching during fire ceremony were, it was like I was having deja vu from growing up with my dad and my grandfather because they were totally militant about the truth and about honesty and about loving yourself and about just like making it happen. I mean, like, the dude was just saying the same things my grandfather and my father were saying and my and and the men in my family were saying on my father's side and on my african side and i was like what the hell is going on here like are you kidding me like I, it's just like i heard this stuff before i grew up with this stuff 
So to me, they told me right there, especially even Iboga told me that this is in your blood. Like this is in, this is your life. This is in your blood. Like this has been in your blood. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. So, um, going to Africa, I felt like I was going home. And it was like, you know, just felt one with the bush. Like, I'm just like, wow, like, this is, this is amazing, you know? And even though it can be, it can be trying at times and, um, you know, because we're so complacent and comfortable with Westworld, you know, I'll be happy to come back home to America, but I love it there. It's it's the roots. It's just like you just feel one with the the earth, with Africa. Like it's just it's amazing. Even though all of it was connected at one point, and it's all the same land. It's all Africa. It's all the earth, all the same earth. There's just something there from where it it started from, and that's the bush. It ain't Africa. Nothing started in Africa. It started in the bush. Life started in the bush. So, that being said, it just, uh, me, it just connected me with my roots. So, to your next question, when it comes to the African culture, since we, uh, African American culture, since we are so bombarded with the distractions, like I said earlier, and and certain ways of living and mentalities, you know, from slavery on down, just definitely like brainwashed African American culture or Africans, period. So, but they still have, they still have it in their blood. It's still in their blood when it comes to the roots from Africa. There's no doubt about it. Mm. But I'm not going to tell you that they don't need it, <laughs> that they definitely need Iboga in their life. I don't care what color you are. Everybody should, should at least, should at least, visit or engage with Africa at least one time in their life. Yeah. At least one time. Specifically African Americans, but I don't care what color you are, it doesn't matter. If you have 1% 1% Afri 1% African blood in your body, you're African. It's like everybody. That's everybody. <laughs> so, you should embrace Africa. Yeah. So, when it comes to the African American culture not like loving themselves and taking on these distractions and 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 and, and living certain ways, you know, you, we we can post blame on on things that have happened, but it's time to look aside that and. Climb up, keep climbing, keep going, keep striving to the top, you know, and I believe, I know, like if we in West world and within the African American culture or any culture embraced the roots, embraced like the rite of passage, embraced initiation, brought that within our cultures, this whole world would be a way better place be a different place showing showing certain respects towards the elements towards the senses towards their life mm. which is all in one so and they all run in threes so if we did that i'm speaking for the african-american culture it would it would definitely change some mentalities on what's going on and and honestly you know growing up 
um, within that culture. Like, they definitely are in tune with the African the, the African culture, but it's 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 bombarded with you know a bunch of other things that are happening going on here in Westworld. You know, it's 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 and it has to deal with a lot of complacency and being comfortable with you know certain ways of living, mm-hmm. and we need to look look beyond that. Yeah, that and we're still living in systemic racism and we're still oh, yeah. uh, having Nazis crawl out of the woodwork and make their stand that's still present, still dealing with historical grief. Like there's still there's still yeah, a lot to work there's, through. There's, and a, lot, there's a lot of trauma, PTSD, if you want to call it, Yeah. Um, that, that is within the African American cultures, yes, definitely they can benefit from this from this medicine, you know, just as well as any other culture would. And you know, that that's basically my advice is like, it's, 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 not everyone's gonna make it, so you know, you better better hop on it now. You better like, you know, you know, take a look, at least take a look, at yeah. least take a look. Like Magenda says, he says, life waits for no one. Nah, it's really just keep going. So you know, same with the earth. It's, the, it's, the it's, it's you know, we, we may destroy each other, but, you know, you ain't going to hurt the earth. <laughs> Come on. The earth is a goddess. It's just like a god, goddess, all in one. Like, that is the real god. The four, the four elements are the real gods. You know what I mean? And goddesses. It's like, come on now. Let's just get real. They're taking, they just had hurricanes and they, they've been taking out uh, cities and just people in general. Fires right an hour away from our, from our house, you know, taking out people's ways of living. It's that easy. It's that simple. So we, we need to start showing some respect, showing some respect to what this earth is really about. Mm, well, that's, um, that, that is a whole other very interesting rabbit hole to get into, um, <laughs> where we are now and what impact, uh, yeah. our, our disrespect, uh, yeah. and inconsiderate behavior around the integrity of the earth is playing in the consequences that we are all facing. <laughs> um, but that is unfortunately a rabbit hole we do not have time for this interview in. Mm. So I want to thank both of you very much uh, for your time here today uh, and for the work that you're doing in the larger, uh, beyond, you know, beyond psychedelic community, but the, lar- the larger community around um, uh, plant medicines. Uh, and uh, also invite you to offer any links or places where people might be able to find out more about... Um, about uh, the book, uh, or about Chor your art, or Elizabeth your uh, work in uh, in in tantra and in, in intimacy, which will be a topic of another episode. Looking forward to interviewing you in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what what links would you like to offer people who would like to seek uh, seek you out more um, more in depth? Uh, you can find me on all those ser- social networks uh, at Chore Boogie. That's C H O R B O O G I E, and same with my website, choreboogie.com. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I definitely invite everyone to check out Chore's amazing work, and a lot of it in the past few years has been inspired by Iboga and the Buiti, and it's visual medicine. It's very powerful transmissions. Uh, so check that out. And you can find me at ebast.net. That's E-B-A-S-T.net. There is a page titled Iboga, which is the best information and resources and um additional support, provider listings, and vital, like, life-saving safety tips. It is a very powerful medicine. No one should ever do it alone or order it online. Um, So please check that out if you have curiosity about the medicine and share it as needed. Um, 
And you can find the book Heart Medicine on Amazon. Just Google Heart Medicine, A True Love Story, or Heart Medicine Iboga. It'll come up. Um, and I do work with people with yoga and private retreats and um, bliss body work sessions for women. I I definitely have more offerings to share and check it out. Yeah. Great. Well, I will make sure for all of the listeners that uh, all of these links can be found at the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com and uh, definitely check out heart medicine it is a uh, it is a really engaging and interesting read uh and finally again thank you both for uh, for your time today and um enjoy the rest of it whatever you choose to do mm-hmm. all right thanks a lot james thank you so all much right. james all right and cut Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Uh, The conversation between Elizabeth Chor and I continued actually after I hit cut. And um, we talked for several minutes after that about um, the language around addiction. Uh, The patrons on Patreon will get early access to that video. Uh, And if you would like that early access and early access um, to sort of behind the scenes after the credits videos of later episodes, you could become my patron on Patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso or following one of the links that will be definitely in the description to the show no matter what podcatcher you are listening to this on or if you're watching it on youtube this type of support for the podcast is really meaningful as it helps nourish my journey forward as a writer and as a podcast host and it also helps to support the platform by which these ideas are positively impacting others around the world So thank you in advance for uh, your participation in supporting me and supporting that journey, as well as a special thank you to my current patrons, especially the ones whose names are in the upper corner of this video and written in the description to the show. You are giving very generously and thank you very much. One final point before the show is done here is um, recently, I guess over the last you know, few years, I've been really investing myself in the learning process around what it means to face the uncomfortable aspects of ourselves and to go back into where we were wounded and find healing in those wounds. And of course, psychedelics has been a main part of that, but psychedelics themselves are not necessarily going to fix you. <laughs> They're not going to fix us uh, simply by merit of, of their nature. It requires Um, preparation, it requires uh, appropriate context, and it requires um, post-experience integration practices and integration support. This is something that I've been very interested in at first for offering to myself and increasingly more so helping others get a grasp of too. Following what seems to be um, seems to be a lot of requests coming in from people uh, to ask me for that kind of support, I have set up a page on my website where you can contact me specifically if you'd like to um, if you'd like to book Skype time with me so that we can have a private discussion about whatever it is that you're going through and um, why it is that you might be approaching psychedelics or the psychedelic experience you might have and and making sense of it in the long run. So the link to that is um, over at jameswgesso.com. It's also in the show notes here. And also as the Patreon funding grows, it's getting allocated into further education for me so that I can offer myself in this way at a greater and greater capacity and support hopefully more people through more challenging times in their lives. So please consider becoming a patron as well if you'd like to support not only my podcasting journey, but my educational journey too. Again, thank you very much and thank you for tuning in to this episode all the way to the end. I will see you on the next one, episode 61 of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.